Thank you. Um, there is, you know, there's a huge gap in educational attainment that men are, are, are the women are defeating men by a three to two margin. And you think of educational attainment and salary being hand in hand, but there is this, again, this stubborn uh, gap persists. Our next guest, very excited, is um, from the Council of Economic Advisors, uh, Sandy Black. She's an economist. She has written and researched on gender equity issues throughout her career, both at the University of Texas, at the New York Fed, and also, of course, at the White House. She put together a presentation actually just for us, which I think is incredibly generous, and that's why we love CEA and their economists. So Sandra's, uh, Sandy's going to run through it, and then Catherine's going to come back up and um, pose some questions. So thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Um, is it on? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, it's exciting to be here. Um, what I want to talk about today is present a few statistics for you to give you some of the background on the gender pay gap and then talk about kind of some of the patterns that we've seen over time and how you should think about it and kind of what the factors are that we think are underlying the disparities that we observe. So just to give you the, the top line number, in 2014, the median earnings of a woman working full-time for a full year in the United States was 79% of the median earnings of a man working full-time full year. In the 1980s and 1990s, the gender pay gap closed a lot. And so um, over that time period, about 17 percentage points. After that time, it flattened out. So since 2000, it's flattened out. And more recently, we've made modest progress. So here's a, a picture of that, um, with the gap closing by 1.8 percentage point from um, 2012 to 2013, and by an additional percentage point between 2013 and 2014. So you can see um, very flat up until the late 1970s, huge improvements um, in terms of women's progress to about 2000, a flattening out, and then kind of an uptick now. Um, Okay, so if you break this down further, you'll see that there are disparities by race. So this is, um, by looking just at the overall number, you're masking some of what's going on. The typical non-Hispanic white woman earned 75% of what the typical non-Hispanic white man earned. Um, for non-Hispanic black women, this was 60% of the typical non-Hispanic white man's earnings. And while the typical Hispanic woman earned only 55%. So if you think about equal pay day being when the tip, the, a woman has to work until um, for free, essentially, um, to, to equal uh, man, um, for, for black and Hispanic women, they have to work a lot longer. So this is, um, this is something that, that I think is masked in the data. If you just compare, for example, non-Hispanic black women to non-Hispanic black men, the gap looks better, but that just shows you that there are big racial differences as well. Um, when you think about the US versus other countries, and this is something that came up in the last um, section, um, the gender pay gap in the United States hasn't substantially changed since 2000, um, but other industrialized nations have been improving. And so um, from the 2000 up to the latest data available, the pay gap fell fastest in the United Kingdom, followed by Japan, Belgium, Ireland, Denmark. Um, as a result, the US pay gap is currently larger than that of many industrialized nations. So this picture gives you an idea of what's going on. This is relative to the gap in the United States, and it tells you that um, all these countries to the left are doing better, and the countries to the right are doing worse in terms of the gender pay gap. And so, um, and so that, I think, is really striking. Um, OK, according to the OECD, the gender wage gap in the United States is about 2.5 percentage points larger than the OECD average. So that's kind of aggregating. Um, and just to give you a comparison, the gender wage gap in New Zealand is less than a third of what it is in the United States. And in Norway, it's 11 percentage points less than the United States. Um, and even in Italy, it's seven percentage points lower. So these are big differences um, that I think are really important. So let's think about what's underlying the gender wage gap. 
if we look historically, um, there were big differences, and people used to cite this all the time, between the education and experience of women. So in the 1980s and 1990s, if you look in the 70s, for example, women had much less experience. They were much less attached to the labor market. Um, and so that was part of the explanation for why they were doing worse. They also tended to be less educated than men, and that was another factor. In the 1980s, you see these things starting to change, and so we see the gender um, gap in experience declining as women have become more and more attached to the labor force. And that explains a large fraction of the decline in the gender wage gap that we observe in the 1980s. In the 1990s, we see women's education going, kind of helping improve the gap. And now, the, the gap in education actually unexplains the gender pay gap because when women are more likely to be enrolled in college than men. So these factors are no longer kind of our primary factors um, in understanding the gender pay gap. And this is, just gives you an idea, I think this graph is really compelling, of the share of post-secondary degrees received by women and the dotted line, dashed line is at 50%. So you see that women at the doctoral, master, and bachelor's level all um, exceed, the fraction women exceeds men. Okay. Um, uh, so this wage gap grows with experience, and this is something I think that was referenced earlier, that if we look over um, at an individual person over time, what we see is that at the beginning, the gap between men and women early in their career is relatively small and then becomes larger with time. And one of the most compelling studies I've seen is work by um, uh, Claudia Golden, Marianne Bertrand, and Larry Katz, where they looked at uh, MBA, Chicago MBA students. And this is really interesting because one of the big things when you say, oh, men earn less than women, you say, well, they have different skills or whatever. They're different, and so you can't really compare them. Here they're looking at MBA graduates from Chicago. So it's a pretty similar group, the men and women who graduate from these programs. They're all really attached to the labor market, and we can actually observe their grades, the courses they took, and things like that. And what you see is that at the beginning of their careers, there's very little gap in pay for men and women, and it's increasing over time. And one of the things that they conclude, and I think that was referenced, is that part of what's going on is that they're taking off time to have children, and they're facing that hit in the workplace as a result. Um, so this is a, a, a graph from Claudia Golden's work, which shows the difference between female and male earnings among college graduates by age for one cohort. So this is kind of, think of it as following the same people over time. Um, and the gap starts out relatively low at negative 0.1, and then it's getting bigger. That's what the decline is. The gap is getting bigger, and we're moving away from zero over time as they age. Um, okay. So at the early stages of their careers, each generation of young women has fared better than the previous generation, so we're doing better over time. Um, in 1980, the typical 18 to 34-year-old woman who worked earned about 74 cents an hour for every dollar the typical male earned. But by 2014, this figure had increased to 91 cents. Um, and one of the potential explanations for this is that women are delaying their childbearing. So um, they're staying in the labor market, they're getting education, and they're delaying their childbearing and taking that hit later on. So they're not kind of hindering their investment early on. Um, another thing that, another factor that was brought up that I, th that I think is really worth thinking about is differences in occupation. And this one I think is interesting because um, it's not clear how you think about differences in occupation. So just to give you some of the information, the research, um, Blau and Kahn show that differences in occupation industry play an important role in the gender pay gap. I think they say that it explains about 51% of, of the, the gap we observe. Um, the BLS, so this may have been different data from what was um, discussed earlier, only reports one occupation in which women out-earned men, and that was stock clerks and order fillers. Um, and there are occupations that are really the opposite, um, personal financial advisors, where the pay gap is 39% within that occupation. Physicians and surgeons, 38%, and um, securities, commodities, and financial services sales, which is 35%. But this brings up a bigger issue of whether we should be 
think controlling for education? Should we be saying, well, um, women and men are working in different occupations, so it's okay that they're um, getting paid differently? Um, and the reason that this is something worth considering is that if the reason that women are choosing the occupations they choose are because um, they know they're going to face discrimination, then isn't that something we want to account for in the gender pay gap? So don't we want to take into account the fact that their choices are a result of discrimination that they're facing in the labor market, either a hostile work environment or something like that? And so um, when people talk about the idea that once you control for all these things, industry and occupation and other characteristics, the gap gets very small, but it's not clear that that's really the right thing to do and the right way to think about it. And I think when you see that in the newspaper, which you see all the time, um, well, there's not much of a gender pay gap once you take all these things into account. You really want to think about, do we want to take all these things as givens, as choices that people made that are not influenced by um, the labor market and the, the discriminatory factors that they face? Um, okay, even within occupation, the pay gap still doesn't fully disappear. So research shows that there's still about 38% of the pay gap that remains even after we, we take account of all these things. And so then the question becomes, what's in the residual? Well, the residual in economics and in statistics is basically the leftover part, the part that we don't know um, and we can't kind of um, attach to something. So what is in this residual? What's this 38% that's left over? Um, one thing is discrimination. So discrimination is out there. There's a lot of evidence that discrimination exists. Um, we think it's probably improving over time as this residual gets smaller. Um, but again, it's because it's this residual, it's very hard to measure. So um, there are some really interesting resume studies that you may read about in the New York Times sometimes. Um, they talk about sending resumes to um, where you kind of randomize what the name of the person is on the resume. And so they've done it for race, they've done it for, for gender, and see how people respond differently to the exact same resume with a different name on it. And so there, you really do have an, uh, the same quality person and you are treating them differently, which is by definition discrimination. So, um, and there's, there's lots of evidence that this type of discrimination still exists. The other thing that I just wanna highlight um, that I think is really interesting is that women differentially negotiate relative to men. And this is something that I find particularly troubling as I have certainly experienced this, and once I learned about this research, it changed my negotiating behavior as a result, um, because I realized that I was making less at UC, when I was a professor at UCLA, and I looked up my salary and realized that I was by $20,000, the lowest paid associate, tenured associate professor um, in the department, because, and I just got a job offer, so I had negotiated, and I had just done very badly, um, and so, um, I did go to my department chair and said, this doesn't look good as the only woman. Um, and, and they were very responsive and raised my pay, so that was good. But this, this observation, I think, is really key. Um, re research shows that women are less likely to negotiate, um, and they, as a result, they, they often are earn less. One of the things that's also interesting is that women are penalized for negotiating. So this goes back to the idea that you're perceived as bossy or pushy or whatever. Um, so um, there is this kind of negative perception that, that is something that we as society need to deal with. Um, one of the things that I think is really important is the idea of pay transparency. I think if everyone knows what the job pays, it's much easier for you to say, this is what I should be making, right? The idea of not knowing and that uncertainty makes women less likely to negotiate. Um, so there are lots of policies that we can do that were mentioned earlier. Um, I think promoting pay transparency is one thing. Paid leave and family-friendly policies would also likely improve the gender pay gap. Research shows that when women have access to paid maternity leave, um, a year after giving birth, they work more and have higher earnings. And again, as was pointed out, the cost of losing workers is very high to firms. So replacing a worker is, is very costly, and so there are benefits on that dimension. Um, lack of access to leave or affordable childcare prevents some women who would like to work from doing so. And one of the interesting statistics 
is that Blau and Kahn show that if the US adopted these family-friendly policies that other European countries have, um, female labor force participation would be four percentage points higher, that, that women would be more attached to the labor force, and as a result, our GDP would be higher. Um, uh, so to conclude, without, just to give you an idea of kind of the macro implications of this, without the increase in employment and hours worked among women since 1970, so if we think about how much women have contributed, um, our G GDP would be $2 trillion smaller. Um, from a business's perspective, policies that promote women's participation can also increase worker productivity and worker retention. And while these policies can help narrow the gen gender pay gap, they also allow businesses to attract and retain the strongest talent, which boosts labor productivity and benefits the economy as a whole. So p individuals benefit, businesses benefit, and uh, the economy benefits. That's it. <laughs> So thank you for that um, great overview about many of the factors that go into that contribute to the pay gap. Um, you mentioned one thing that that I've I'm very interested in pay transparency, mm -hmm. and you talked about your own yep. circumstance <laughs> where I guess there were public records yes. about what everyone was earning. I'm curious, are you aware of any um, like larger scale real world experiments of, mm -hmm. of any kind where there has been more pay, pay transparency and, and that has or has not, for that matter, affected the gender pay gap? Like has anybody looked at whether at public universities right. there's less of a pay gap than at private ones because you know, this, this information is, is freely available? So I don't, I'm not aware of any studies that have done that. There, there's actually, while I was at the university, at UCLA, they did a study because the Sacramento Bee actually publishes all the, the pay of everyone at UCLA. This is how I found it out. And um, what they did was they randomized who found out, they, they randomly sent emails to some faculty and not others, letting them know that their salaries were all available online because most people didn't know, and then compared how people did afterwards. But I don't, they weren't looking at the gender pay gap, so I don't, I don't remember if they, I think they may not have looked at it, but I'm not sure. But it was, that's the only study I've seen of this type at all. I think there just aren't very many circumstances where all of a sudden you just get information about people's pay. What they did find was that people were less happy mm -hmm. as a result because <laughs> they find out that they're not doing so well. So. I see. What about in terms of the negotiation gap, that, mm -hmm. that women don't negotiate as aggressively as men, but on the other hand, if they do negotiate more aggressively, that could be held against them, seen right. as unlikable, nobody wants to work with them, et cetera. Um, are there policy tools or, or other tools that we have, right. not necessarily ones that come from Washington, right. that could help narrow that that contributor to the pay I gap? Think, I think that's a really good question because this is something that I puzzled over when I first heard about this research was it's a catch-22, right? That you should negotiate because you're not getting enough money and you're not getting paid the same salary that you should be getting, but there's a cost to you. And so in my own personal experience, and so this is not very good economic research, but um, from my own personal experience, they, a lot of the negotiating happens after they've already offered you the job. And so um, I was really worried when I was negotiating that you know, I was gonna be perceived badly because I asked for a lot more when I moved to Texas than from UCLA because I had learned about this. Um, and so, and then people don't remember in the long run. Like someone even said to me, I can't believe you asked for this because my department chair actually told the, other people what I had asked for and I was like I'm asking for anything if, I, if there's anything I think that if a guy asked in a year and I hadn't asked for it would I be mad and I asked for everything and so um, and he went and told people that I'd asked for this and they were like I can't believe you asked for it and now these people are my friends and you know they're happy right because they're now they can ask for it the next time they negotiate so I do think this is a, a bit of a catch-22 and there isn't really an answer of how to get around the, the negative perception, but I do think because a lot of negotiation happens after you've already gotten the job, um, that it's, it's still something we should really work on. And I think from a policy perspective, pay transparency is really, really important because if you don't know what you can ask for, um, 
women are less likely to ask. So if there's uncertainty whether you can negotiate, women are more likely to say, okay, thank you, and, and not ask. So, You mentioned during your presentation that um, a lot of firms see higher productivity, higher retention rates, things like that. I mean, I know Laszlo Bach at Google has mm -hmm. talked about this quite publicly, that it's, it's been good for business for them to have a generous family leave program. Um, they hold on to workers for longer. So if that's the case, why aren't more firms doing it? I mean, if it is good for the bottom line, why aren't more firms doing it? Are they getting the accounting wrong? Is it just that they're too small to be able to, you know, provide these kinds of perks? Um, or it's too, or they're afraid of like adverse selection, that they're going to get all the workers who are, you know, planning to go on right. leave after right. leave after leave, or what? I mean, why, why, if it is so good for businesses, why aren't they doing it right. on their own? What's the market failure? And I think that's a really good question because I wonder this about a whole bunch of things. Like there are a whole bunch of things that we think are good for productivity that firms aren't doing that, that I don't totally understand. I think in this case, there is the issue that it's potentially you could get this adverse selection, which is the people who decide they want to try to work for these firms are the ones who are going to take advantage of the benefits, right? And say, okay, all the women are going to go work at this firm because, because uh, they offer paid leave. Um, in reality, things like paid leave are a family thing, not a, a woman's issue. Um, but also, that doesn't seem to be what's happening. But I think that is one reason. And because of that, I think that's why we do need kind of a government intervention, a kind of collective action um, to, to kind of fix that, that problem. So related to that, I wanted to pitch to you the same question that I tried asking several times, okay. but I'm not sure I asked clearly enough in the previous panel, which is how do you prevent these kinds of family-friendly policies from being seen as women targeted right. policies and therefore sort of subtly encourage employers to not hire women because they figure they'll be more expensive staffers right. you know right. I mean how, how do you basically uh, make the workplace more family friendly but given that women are more likely to take advantage of those kind of policies right. how do you not um, discourage employers from hiring women as a result right well I think I mean one thing is that I think I think that too is a good question. You're asking very good questions and things that I've, I've puzzled over. One of the things that, that they've actually implemented in parts of Europe is trying to make it more of a gender neutral leave, that it's not just a women's thing, it's a family leave. And in fact, some parts, I think in Norway, since I've done a lot of research in Norway, um, you actually, the men will lose, the men have their own leave and they will lose it if they don't take it. And so you actually, as a family, will have more leave if both the woman and the man leave. Um, but even there, they have problems that men are not taking it up as much as, as women. And so there's some research showing that, um, that if their family takes it up, you're more likely to take it up, that, that there are these big peer effects. And so suggesting that it needs to be kind of a societal movement that says this is what, how we as a society think it should be. But I, I think, I think it, is, it is an issue. It doesn't seem like it's really happened, that it's borne out in terms of the firms, at least my understanding of the firms who have adopted these policies. So I don't think the problem has been realized, um, but I think it's something that that you have to think about. What about childcare? Is there any research that suggests that greater access to affordable childcare or even longer school days has any effect on women's attachment to the labor force and the pay gap? Yeah, I mean, so I think the, the research is actually really good in terms of um, that, that access to childcare increases um, uh, women's labor force participation, access to affordable and quality childcare actually also is a great investment in children. So I think that's really a win-win, that, that the evidence is that um, women become more attached to the labor market, labor market or stay attached, and the children benefit as well. What about in terms of the pay gap? Is there any, do we know yet whether that has any effect? I'm trying to think, I can't think, I think most of the research has focused on, I think there, I can't, I, I don't think it's actually focused on the, the wage Okay, that, that's yeah. fine. Um, this is another question that I had mentioned in, in the previous session. It sounds like you have some thoughts on this, uh -huh. which is to what extent should we be encouraging women to go into occupations or industries that are more lucrative? You know, mm -hmm. to, you know, the prototypical example that I often hear, particularly from conservatives, is like, why aren't you, why are you majoring in dance history rather than 
uh, computer science. You know, right. that, that would do a lot to close the pay gap. Right. Is, is, to what extent would, um, c could or should, I guess, the government um, try to incentivize women to enter, to make different choices that could potentially lead to higher paying careers? I think it depends on why they're making the choices that they're making, right? If it's just that there is, that they, you know, prefer one thing over the other, I think that, you know, doesn't seem like it's something that necessarily would require government intervention. However, there's a lot of evidence that starting really early on, there are gender norms and there are, you know, the, um, media bias, implicit bias, there's all this stuff that, that children face um, that affects the choices that they make. And so if you really thought that women didn't like doing math, then pushing women to do math isn't a good thing. If you thought women don't like doing math because um, they experience an environment that they don't, you know, are not comfortable in, they're not encouraged societally, they're told they're not as good at it, then that's something we need to fix. And so I think it depends on what the root cause is for, for the different choices to the extent that it's really, I prefer one thing over the other, but everything else is equal, then it's you know, not something we necessarily would worry about. If it's the result of a circumstance that um, is pushing me in one direction over the other, then I think that's something where the government should step in. What about, for example, giving more financial aid mm -hmm. to majors that you know, or tied to more lucrative careers or uh -huh. something like that? Or, I mean, it, it, has that been tried? Is, is that something that's worth looking into? There's been some research that shows, and this is, was a student of mine, um, where it looked at the SMART grant program that gave in, provided incentive to um, major in STEM fields and kind of was a little bit of extra money um, and said, and finds, you know, some effect that, that, that people will adjust their major. I don't know that I think that's, the way to go about the gender pay gap because I think a it's starting much earlier and and yeah and and I think a lot of what we can do here is an information story as well that people you know people don't know about the majors they don't know about schools and I think a lot of the decisions they make when you look at 17 year olds are really not that well as someone who has a an 18 year old stepson are not as well informed as you might hope when they're making life decisions. Um, so I think, I don't know that I think that that's necessarily the direction that I would go first. Mm -hmm. um, I think those are, I think, I think, I think we're, we're good. Yes, okay, well, I think we're out of time. But, oh, okay. um, but thank you so much yeah, for, for joining us yeah. and for this presentation and thank you everyone for, for attending. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you Catherine, thank you Sandy. Thanks everybody for, for coming today. It's a, this is, uh, as you said, it's the interesting kind of divisive political holiday about a gap that we would like to see disappear. I hope people really profited from this. I, I mean, I thought it was a really full discussion and I really appreciate you bringing a presentation to this as well. And uh, if it's available to, for other folks, we would love to send it out. So th thank you so much.